Hey there. Welcome for those who just joined us and welcome back to Programmers Week for those of you who attended our tech talks and keynotes uh, this week or today. My name is Alin, for those of you who don't know me. I'm the community manager for mobile and AI. Uh, and uh, happy to introduce you another AI talk now presented by Alex. Um, <clears throat> if we had a talk uh, one hour ago uh, that uh, talked about the design patterns that we use in uh, machine learning. Uh, now we are uh, also going to talk about best practices uh, in this field. So Alex is one of our senior um, machine learning engineers and also our uh, machine learning community lead. He handles all the knowledge sharing, uh, trainings, mentoring, and also client presentations <clears throat> and proposals. Uh, for our community. He is one of the first uh, AI engineers in Cognizant Subvision a couple of years ago when he transitioned from uh, development to machine learning. Uh, described by his own words, he lives by, at the intersection of data science and machine learning. So depending on the project needs and, um, and, uh, <clears throat> and the client requirements, Alex can handle data discovery, exploration, feature engineering, and model development in various scenarios that involved either a traditional machine learning or deep learning. <clears throat> so uh, let's see from his experience, what are some of the best practices that we need to use uh, in machine learning? Um, Alex, the floor is yours. Yep. Hi there. Um, thanks for joining us uh, for Programmers Week. So I'm Alex and I work as a machine learning engineer. And I'm also, as Alan said, the, the machine learning community lead, where besides the projects I work on, um, I'm also taking care of the growth of the community and I'm working with a great team that, uh, that makes me proud day by day. So I'm really excited to, to talk about some of the best practices that would help during uh, machine learning workflow. And I encourage everyone to, to share your questions in, well, in the chat and I'll try to, to answer them. So without further, uh, without further anticipation. I'm going to share my screen and let's start. So you should be able to see my screen. Um, so as I said, uh, we're going to talk about best practices in, in a machine learning workflow. Um, I'm going to go over the agenda. So the agenda, agenda for today, um, I've broken it down uh, the whole workflow in uh, in different phases due to the fact that machine learning workflow is an iterative process. So we'll go from, from identifying the business goal to actually framing it as a machine learning problem and then putting the focus on, um, on data modeling and in the end evaluation and deployment. So let's go to, to the first one. So the question is, for the business goal identification is uh, what I'm actually trying to do, right? So this is the more the most important phase as uh, well, a company considering machine learning should have a clear idea uh, of what it's trying to solve. And actually about the business value that machine learning solution um, is, is going to bring. So you must be able to, to measure business value against some business objectives and a success criteria, right? So, well, this holds true for any technical solution. But this is this may be a bit challenging for uh, solutions considering machine learning because machine learning is a disruptive technology. So after you determine um, your criteria for success, you need to evaluate uh, your organization's or, or company's ability to actually execute that target. So the target um, should be achievable and you should have a clear way to, to, to the moment you reach, uh, you reach production. So what you want to do is to evaluate that machine learning is actually the right approach for the business goal. Evaluate all the options because there are some cases where companies uh, push machine learning if it, even if it's not, not the case. You also need to evaluate um, how accurate the, the resulting outcomes would be and what's the actual cost of, of, achieving, uh, of achieving your objective. So at least for machine learning uh, to be successful, it's extremely important to have a lot of data and uh, it needs to be high quality. So basically because it needs to, this is applied to the algorithm that, uh, that, you, uh, that you're going to train. So carefully you need to, to evaluate the ability to, um, 
to make the to have the correct data and to have the data sources accessible and um, and available. So, for example, throughout the process, uh, you need uh, data to train, you need data to benchmark a model, but you also need high quality data from the business to uh, to to evaluate the the value of the whole the whole machine learning solution. So. Key takeaways um, in this in these steps is that make sure you understand very well the business requirements and ask tons of questions because you really need to decide if machine learning is is a feasible approach in in this um, in this case. So try to think in advance about costs uh, that imply data acquisition if you don't have the data, the model training and inference and resources needed for uh, for the model and how also how costly it would be for the business to have wrong predictions in production. Um, so if you determine that this is feasible, make sure you do your homework and um, uh, try to review proven or published work in similar domains. This pretty much helps a lot because you won't really need to reinvent the wheel each, um, each time. So um, going from the business goal, to actually framing the problem as uh, uh, to framing it as a machine learning problem, um, you actually want want to to look over what is observed and well actually what should be predicted, right? No, as this is no this is known pretty often as a label or or a target variable. So the um, determining what to predict and how performance and error metrics uh, need to be optimized, well, it's a key step, right? Because this is how you frame it. So for example, imagine uh, a scenario uh, where a company wants to identify which products will maximize profit. So um, reaching this goal, it depend, depends on basically determining uh, which products to, to increase in production. So in this scenario, what you want to do is to actually predict the future sales of the product based on past data and current data, right? So the future sale, the predicting the future sales uh, becomes the problem to solve and using machine learning is well, one of the approaches that, uh, that can be used to solve it. Um, again, some key takeaways um, in this step imply defining the success criteria as basically the road becomes a little easier once you know what the target is and what are your uh, actual objectives. So most of the time you may optimize for accuracy, but there are times when you may optimize for prediction latency, for example, and you need to, to find an optimal uh, trade-off between the two. This is the case if you deploy apps that use machine learning on, on edge devices, right? So due to the fact that the models are smaller, uh, they, are, uh, they are optimized, uh, but you need to find a trade-off on how accurate is the model and how speedy it is. So also before going to the phases that tackle data, um, you may already want to, um, to think about different strategies for data sources or even annotation if, uh, if you're going a certain, a certain approach. So framing it as a supervised learning problem uh, needs labels or targets, right? So this may imply building annotation tools um, Having a labeling team, it also imply it may also imply delays in the timeline of the project, or besides building validation uh, annotation tools, you can go also to external services like uh, like Amazon's Mechanical Turk. But in the end, all of this may imply additional costs. Um, after framing it, um, well, let's go over data collection. So in machine learning workloads, uh, the data, which in this case, let's say it's uh, it's based on the inputs and the corresponding uh, the corresponding outputs, it serves three important functions, right? So it's defining the goal of the system, which is actually the output representation, um, with uh, and the relationship to to and the relationship for each output uh, related to the input. Also, it has a function in the training of 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 the algorithm that uh, that will associate those inputs to the actual outputs, and also in terms of measuring the performance, um, if for to to check if the performance target was met. 
So um, as basically the organizations, they try to collect and analyze increase, increasingly large amounts of data, uh, there are so, traditional solutions of storing that data uh, becomes, um, becomes a little tedious and well, it can no longer, uh, it can no longer keep, uh, keep the pace. So in this phase, you may want to take a look at uh, cloud-based data lakes. Pick, uh, you may pick the, the top vendors, the top cloud vendors, if you already have the infrastructure there. And well, a cloud-based data lake is basically a central repository where data can be stored, uh, structured or unstructured. And you can store it, of course, as it is. Um, and the good thing is that you can run, you can run over it different types of strategies. If you want to do visualizations, look over dashboards, uh, you do big data uh, processing, you can do real-time analytics, and also reaching machine learning. So all of this uh, has the purpose of guiding you to, to, to take better decisions. So at this stage, uh, what you may want to actually do as a takeaway is have a clear understanding um, of the sources and the steps needed to get the data and confirm its quality and availability um, along, uh, along ways to ensure the governance even though as you may have a data team, um, the, governments, the governance may be, may be assured by it. Also, if um, you, as I said, if you use a cloud vendor already, take a look at how, uh, at how they, they may provide you with, with data lake solutions. Um, data collection then leads to actual data preparation, which is very important in machine learning as uh, machine learning models are only as good as the data uh, used to train them. So after the data is collected, um, the integration, annotation of the data, the preparation or processing uh, is basically critical, right? So uh, an essential attribute of suitable training data is that, well, it's provided in such a way prepared in such a way uh, that it's suitable for training a model and make it generalized. So in this step, you may want to start with a small statistically valid data set and then iterate on it with different, uh, with different strategies and also ensure you maintain its, its integrity. So one important thing is that um, you may want to have a feedback loop here. Right, because you may not narrow all the tidbits from the beginning. So allocate your uh, yourself time to experiment with different strategies uh, for the preparation step, and um, also try to have validation steps to, during the uh, during during the pre-processing uh, pipeline, in order to catch certain anomalies that uh, that can occur in the data preparation steps. That this will also help in the future due to the fact that you may end up having uh, retraining pipelines that, uh, that are automated. So uh, going next, um, data visualization, it's also an, another important aspect and well, it's a key aspect to actually uh, understand your data because you want, what you want to do is uh, to identify patterns, right? So, these patterns are not that obvious when you look at uh, data in tables. So the correct visualization tool can help you to quickly gain a good understanding um, of, of your data. Uh, so before, what to think, how to think about it is that before choosing a certain type of chart, decide uh, what you want to show. So for example, charts, um, can, can display information uh, such as KPIs, relationships between variables, comparisons, you can look over distributions, you can look over correlations or, or even compositions. So as a key takeaway, several key takeaways in there, profi profile data, your data, understand it, and va validate the, uh, the, the assumption that uh, you had previously. Right, so continue, also continue asking questions. So there are some great analytical tools in this space, uh, like Power BI, also there's Data Studio, and uh, the the output pretty great dashboards. So even more, even more, this tool helps. Uh, all of these tools help due to the fact that uh, you may want to have a way to monitor, as I talked in the previous slide, about certain anomalies. So you may further down uh, some possible issues. Cool. So. Um, 
after cleaning, after visualizing the data, after preparing it, uh, doing all those steps, um, you may end up in the feature engineering space, right? So this is the process of going from raw data to actual features that are prepared uh, uh, for, for the model training. So every unique feature uh, of the data, is every unique attribute of the data is considered a feature, right? So for example, uh, when, ex when designing a solution for predicting the customer churn or a recommender system, you look at customer data, you look at, um, you look at features that capture maybe his age, maybe his location, uh, maybe his purchases, maybe his interactions, uh, his logins. So the purpose is to select and transform all the attributes of the data um, in order to, to, to be able to feed them to, to a predictive model. So all this, uh, all this feature engineering step uh, can be divided in several steps, such, are, such as the feature creation, or and feature transformation, feature extraction, or, and also feature selection. So going over the first one, um, when I say feature creation, I talk about identifying the feature, uh, the features in the data set that well, are actually relevant right, to, to the problem that, that you're trying to solve. Uh, transformation refers to, uh, for example, inputting uh, missing variables or, or uh, checking for features that, that are not valid. Also, it implies other types of transformation. So maybe uh, you have numeric variables and it's a good approach to, to bin them. Maybe you apply a log transform over them. Uh, feature extraction refers, of, refers to the process of actually creating features from existing features. Uh, with, I mean, you may have the goal here to basically reduce the dimensionality. So one way to do this as, well, oh, uh, my other colleague Dan talked about multimodal inputs uh, uh, two sessions ago. So one way to 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 use feature extraction is to have basically if you have image data, you can use vision models to extract the most important features from uh, from from those images and maybe uh, supply them further down the line in in a complex model. And also in terms of feature selection, um, this is the process of actually filtering out the irrelevant information. So you may do this by uh, even looking by looking at the variance, you can look at the correlations if uh, if you want to to decide which features uh, which features which features to, to remove. Also um, when you decide which features which features to remove is it's very important to sync up with uh, with domain experts um, because working in different domains it requires different types of expertise. So uh, domain expertise provided by a customer by internals uh, is, is very valuable. So in this way, you're way more sure on how to remove irrelevant features and identify the ones um, that are most important, even though you may end up in the case that some of the features that are considered, that are considered important for the business uh, may not seem as important uh, for the model. But again, there's a very high chance um, that you'll get back to this step pretty often because um, you'll have more clarity over the feature importance after the after you start you start iterating over over models. Cool. So the feature uh, engineering step precedes uh, precedes the the start of the modeling. So. Um, when you start to select the machine learning model, you want to select the best one, uh, which is actually appropriate, um, and you start training, it, right? So as part of actually training a machine learning model, you're provided with training data that it learns from, and you basically set, need to set uh, the model's parameters to, to optimize the training process. Well, typically each training algorithm, each machine learning algorithm computes uh, several metrics such as the training error or the prediction accuracy. Well, all of these metrics um, can help you determine uh, whether the model is uh, converging, is learning well, and how well it will generalize for, for making predictions on, on unseen data. So metrics uh, reported by the algorithms, uh, they depend on the type of, of algorithm that, that you choose. So for example, a classification algorithm uh, 
can be measured. You can measure its accuracy uh, with with a confusion matrix that will capture true positives or true negatives, and also false positives or false negatives. So. If you look on the other side, if you choose a regression uh, algorithm, it can be measured by by root mean squared error. Um, also, inside any model, uh, there are different settings uh, that can be tuned to control its behavior. So, um, also, well, it also it controls the the internal architecture, right? So, these types of settings are called hyperparameters. So, there are a number of hyperparameters and they vary across different types of models. And some of them, well, are specific if we talk about, for example, deep learning, where you have learning rates, where you have uh, epochs, where you have the number of hidden layers, uh, hidden units, or you have different activation functions. Also, when starting to, to, to optimize hyperparameters, you'll end up in the step where, where, you, where you want to find these parameters uh, in an optimal space. So for such, you may use an optimization algorithm that uh, that will imply um, gaining the, the the optimal model architecture. Also, um, it's very important in this step to have a clear understanding of the type of algorithm that uh, that you choose, and also think about how you're going to test it. So, for example, in model choosing, depending on your data set size, uh, one great thing about uh, one great thing in, in deep learning, especially, is that you can use pre-trained models uh, as a base for what you're doing. So, for example, if you're into computer vision um, and have a limited data set, there are some great models out, out there that you can adapt for your use case if your data domain is similar to, to what the model was trained on. And also one great thing lately, um, especially in NLP, is that you can make your, you can make your life way easier um, even if you have a big data set and a smaller uh, label data set, because um, um, not long ago, uh, some language models were developed that can be trained to understand uh, the context on, on labeled data sets uh, by masking a certain amount of words and then forcing the model to, to predict the, constants, uh, the context, um, uh, to, to predict the actual word based on the context. So pretty much everyone's using these types of models on each Google search they, they do. Um, also, as you go along the, the training phase, uh, what you want to do is maybe you want to squeeze, uh, as I said earlier, the best, of, uh, the best of your model. And you have several options in, in this space. So you can go through, uh, you can go through a usual great search, or you can look at available optimization tools or optimization library. For example, for a large scale, uh, nowadays, uh, Horovod is, is something used in, in the industry. So it has the ability to optimize the parameters uh, way, way better. Cool. So um, after the model was trained uh, and, uh, and, and validated, well, we need to evaluate if it's actually, uh, it actually gets the performance and uh, the accuracy that uh, that we need, right? Because we actually need to achieve the, the business goal. So you might want to generate the step as you have, uh, you may have a lot of data, you may talk with the domain experts. Maybe one idea is to, is to generate uh, multiple model candidates and then evaluate how effective each one is. So for example, when uh, computing the data set, you could apply different business rules, right, for for each model, and then apply um, different measures to determine uh, how well the model behaves. So, depending on the model, you may want to evaluate if the model needs to be more sensitive than specific, or more specific than sensitive. Also, you may end up in a multi-class uh, in a multi-class scenario. So, if you do so. Uh, make sure that you evaluate how well the model behaves on each class uh, separately. Um, different ways of evaluating the model uh, could be could be like evaluation, uh, like offline evaluation, or it can also uh, it could it can also be with with live data, which is a type of online evaluation. So in offline evaluation, 
pretty much um, you have a model that is trained, uh, evaluated, and then tested finally with uh, with a part of the data set known as a holdout set. So this holdout set is never touched, uh, is never used for uh, for training or actual validation. is using is used only to uh, to measure its its perf its generalizing power. So. One important thing, if it's a supervised problem, uh, the, <clears throat> if it's a supervised problem, make sure that you have high quality annotations on that holdout set uh, from the beginning. So you won't end up with surprises and see the performance decrease once, once the model uh, ends up in, in production. So if all goes well, uh, pretty much you're, gonna, you're going to end up deploying it. So there's a high chance um, that once you put your model in production, its performance may start to, to decrease uh, over time. So it's important to think about ways to monitor it, right? Uh, and you have two options here. Uh, one, it's easier, one, it's costly. I mean, uh, both are not easier, but you have uh, a way of having someone maintaining it, monitoring it, or there's another way, another way uh, with uh, actually having automated steps that uh, once uh, performance decrease is detected, uh, the retraining pipeline uh, is starting and the model and the model is is updated. So the model needs to be monitored um, for for a time, and we need to compare its predictions uh, with what the business actually uh, expects, right? So. In this step, what you may want to do is to look on how it behaves in the real world, right? So a good, uh, a good thing to do is to go through, through A-B testing, right? So uh, maybe you have an A-B testing uh, production environment, so use it on a smaller subset of users, monitor the performance, validate, the uh, validate with the business, and if all goes well, you maybe do a wave rollout to increase its usage, and you end up in the same cycle. Right, as, as we see in the figure here. So once we deploy, we monitor. If the performance decreases, uh, we may go ahead through the data, data acquisition phase. We go again through, through data preparation, feature engineering, development, and deployment again. So it's a cycle that uh, we need to, to iterate. Cool. So um, in the end, I wanted also to lay out some, some general design principles and um, they pretty much cover uh, on a higher level what I've talked about before, but with an emphasis on different parts. And uh, also it's important to, in this part, I'm going to start with the first one with, uh, with, with, uh, with enabling the agility on, on workloads. So the, the higher the availability of high of high quality data set, uh, the quicker the, the the data science workload advanced. So pretty much we encountered this throughout the way. Uh, there were blocking points in in in, in the data sources that uh, that blocked us on on some pro on on some projects. Um, after you you get your hands on the data, start simple. Start with simple models. Start with a small set of features, because if you choose a complex model uh, from the beginning, you may lose uh, you may lose the track of, of of each feature's impact. Right. So choose a model, perform a series of experiments throughout all the process. Um, one thing that I didn't mention before is uh, the idea of decoupling the the model training and evaluation with model deployment. Um, in terms of picking up the solutions that best align with each phase. So for training, you may want to do it at a larger scale with multiple resources, but during deployment, you will maybe need only one, uh, one hosting service. So try to separate and decouple them. Also, um, again, I'm going to talk about de detecting data drift and model drifting. So in order to, to detect uh, the data drift over time, you need to continuously measure uh, its accuracy right after it's in production. So due to the fact that data comes in from multiple sources and uh, well, the shape, its shape may change over time. And also, for example, some, um, 
some attributes may change over time. We experienced this not long ago, and it broke it broke our flow. Uh, you may you may want to have mechanisms um, in place that that detect some changes. So uh, some of these changes, so that you can take appropriate actions. Also, um, one idea to save time is to automate the training and evaluation pipeline. Right. So pretty much, um, if you're in a data drift scenario, you, you detect the data drift, you detect the model drift, um, this step will basically, this step will be executed once the trigger goes on. Um, it basically goes over the, the training pipeline, uh, overall decreases the actual manual effort, and oh, it also reduces the human error. And um, one final step would be look at different abstractions in terms of what you want to choose. So if you don't have a data science team, uh, you have three options. So you either look at AutoML solutions, which are, which are which pretty much behave like black boxes. Uh, you hire your own data your, your own data science team, or you come to us. But either way. Uh, you should do uh, a good evaluation of what are the abstractions and what costs uh, do each one uh, implicate. Cool. So um, this is pretty much everything from me today. And I look forward to, to your questions. No questions yet. <laughs> so I guess you are very clear. Do you have any other advices, Alex? If uh, <laughs> we have still have some time. <laughs> Well, mostly I wanted to go over different scenarios, uh, the overall principles and in, in, in the workflow, and of course, thinking on how, how you approach it. So everything is about planning in every phase because uh, each, each, each step you miss, it will bite you uh, down, the full, uh, down the full pipeline. Okay, <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. I I know it was useful for many of uh, of us. Oh, here is a question: What about bias in the collection and in developing models? How do you face and fix issues arising arising from those biasing? I think if you have a data with a bias, maybe. What about bias in the collection and in developing models? How do you face and fix the issues arising from those? Um, so bias is uh, is pretty. It's a pretty sensible uh, thing, and well, you need to uh, you need to tackle it at the data at basically the data set level. So from the definition of bias, it, each. So can you share some experience with things? This is another question, or it's from the same person. Yes. So pretty much uh, the bias that we imply, at least in the data set level, we, uh, at least our bias, we treated it with, uh, with the domain experts. OK. And can you share some experiences where things went wrong and how you recovered from it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so. We usually have um, we usually have issues with the data sets, so things may went wrong. I mean, at least in one case, uh, due to some bugs in a validation tool, and we ended up having uh, having up having up messed up labels. So uh, one lucky thing that we did in um, in that case uh, was to actually use some big models. To, to further refine the predictions and the labels. 
on the on the small subset that that we did. So this uh, this went very wrong because uh, the team uh, the team to that actually labeled the data uh, was paid with with a high amount of money, and we ended up in the end after all the data labeling was was completed, we, we noticed this. And of course, it wasn't an option to spend the same amount of money um, to, to, to label them again. Yep. Let's see if there are any more questions. It seems like a lot of this is planning, trial and error, analyzing results and adjusting. It seems very similar to the QE process. Do you think ML could be applied to assist in testing efforts? A good question. <laughs> yes, and I know our QA community, it looks into this. So um, we actually had a POC uh, once a while, a while ago that tackled the uh, the, the automation of, of, of tests, right? So it was basically used in a vision scenario where we would basically detect different elements on the UI and all of this tool will be, would have been automated. But yeah, it can be applied even to design different test scenarios or identify or even small pieces of machine learning that could help in, in, in this part, so certainly. Yeah, I think, and there are also some, uh, as far as I know, there are also already on the market some tools that um, do, uh, like I'll automate AI, um, automated testing. Uh, there are some tools that, uh, let's say, validate your code using AI also. So already there are some uh, uh, some steps taken in in this uh, in this uh, direction. Let's say. Uh, yeah, and you're right. You, we have a, a talk right after this um, by our uh, one of our QA teams that uh, uh, that uh, will talk about. Uh, they they tackled AI, and I also know that on the QA stage uh, we had a lot of. I mean, some talks about the AI in testing. So uh, once the recordings are done, you can feel free to check those out. Of course. Okay, if there are no more questions, I want to thank Alex for the presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, see you, the rest of you, in 20 minutes for, for the next one. Enjoy thank the rest of Programmers Week. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Bye. Bye.